your mindset is different than an employee. It says rich dad and poor dad. Yeah. Poor dad, employee. Rich dad, entrepreneur. We get wake up calls on our finances. Some people, the phone's ringing off the hook right now. Are you going to answer the phone? Are you going to change your life where you say, This crisis should inspire people to get wealthier or you can be a loser. The biggest crisis coming up right now after this pandemic. My life changed forever when I decided to change a poor mindset into a rich mindset. And in this video, I'm bringing you Dave Ramsey and Robert Kiyosaki to teach you how to have that rich mindset. Almost 25 years now, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? Are you sick and tired of talking about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or is it still something you enjoy talking about? No, that's kind of what we were talking about. This is what I'm supposed to have done anyway. You know, mm. I mean, it was, uh, so I got on my path. I meet a lot of guys who something tragic happens in their life, but it was the best thing that ever happened to them. Like I, I had a friend who was a, a Olympic uh, snowboarder and he did one of those goofy things those guys do. And he shattered his body oh. and nobody could heal him. So he became an acupuncturist. And the guy is the greatest, he found this real gift. It's not snowboarding or whatever he was doing, is he's a healer. Mm -hmm. And he uses acupuncture, you know, and he heals people. He's unbelievably good. But if he hadn't crashed, he wouldn't be where he is today. Yeah. What was the big tragedy in your life? Oh, there's every other, every or, other day. There's <laughs> every or, other day. What was the big tragedies? What was like the big aha moments where something bad had to happen for you to say, oh, let me wake up and take down this path? Oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, I really was, uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, my biggest failure was that I was, I was successful in my first venture. Mm. Uh, and my, I was, I, this is, I don't know, I was about 25 years old. And I started the nylon and Velcro surfer wallet business. And everybody said, well, why, why are you doing that? I said, well, I don't know what else to do, you know? Right. And I used to make nylon wallets. I went to school in New York at a military school, and a sailing school. So I used to sell these nylon wallets out of sales. So when we're looking for an idea for a product, you know, the product sucks. The product doesn't really count. I just needed to start a business. So I was working at Xerox at the time in Honolulu, and I, I gave my, I showed this little wallet to my two partners, two criminals, but anyway. So we, we came out with these nylon wallets. We had them manufactured in Korea and nobody would buy them. <laughs> so I have 100,000 wallets in a warehouse in New York. I'm in Hawaii and my friend and I are going door to door trying to sell these stupid No wallets. way. And everybody kept saying, are you shitting me? What are you guys doing? You know, well, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. what happened was because we failed at the wallet business, I was sitting in our offices in Honolulu and then somebody says, Hey, these you know, jogging had just started. Baby boomers are get, first getting into health and they started jogging. They had the Nike waffle and all these other good shoes. Yeah. Right? And so this guy in Golden Gate Park goes for a jog. And he didn't know what to do with his key. So he put his key on top of his car tire. And he went for a run. And guess what? He came back and his car was gone. Wow. <laughs> and so the headline says, uh, San Francisco Times, where says, what does a jogger do with their key? And I went, oh, my God. So since I have kind of a quasi-engineering background, you know, I designed with a hook and tear method and built the shoe pocket that went on a runner's shoe. So I had this nylon wallet, now I had a runner's shoe. I mean, a shoe pocket. So I go around the world again. So I'm, I'm going, we're going broke so fast. You know, I had no money. I was just borrowing money, raising capital. But it was all good because I was learning how to raise capital. Yeah. So finally, we're desperate. We buy a full, th those days, it took four months for an ad to come out. So we had to shoot this stupid shoe pocket on a, on a New Balance 320 shoe. And we get it into Runner's World magazine. Uh -huh. I think it cost me 16,000 bucks. Oh, was my like, gosh. Oh. A lot of money. And then we waited for the phone to ring. So we had to wait till like January, February, March. And you know, the phone didn't ring. So we want to quit. We're out of money. You know, can't pay the rent. The repo with my heart. <laughs> and it was, it was getting so bad. So my, let's give one more shot. Just one more shot. So we, we go to New York City at the sporting goods show at the Coliseum. 
and I'm setting up my booth in the basement because that's all I could afford. And this guy goes walking past and he goes, my company was called Rippers. So I'm putting my big sign up, Rippers, you know, and he goes, Rippers, Rippers, where have you been? And I turn around and said, I'm here. No, 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 no. He says, where have you been? I'm like, what do you mean? He says, I saw your ad. I said, good. My store is filled with people coming in looking for the shoe pocket. Wow. I said, call me. <laughs> that's what I said. So I asked him, why didn't you call me? He says, you idiot. You don't have your address or phone number on the ad. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And then what happened is Playboy put a pic, you know, they featured this young thing with uh, nothing on but a shoe bucket. And our sales went to run. I, was, I looked like a genius. But wow. this is where it went broke. We couldn't keep up with demand. The wallets, wallets took off. Shoe pockets took off. We were borrowing and borrowing and borrowing just to finance inventory. We were shipping all over the world. And we went broke because I kept raising money and one day, but we were already like 850,000 in debt, which is a lot of money back then. Wow. It's a lot of money right now. Yeah. Well, it's relative. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I go back to my partner, Stanley, the accountant, the CPA, the CFO. And I said, how much more do I have to raise? He says, I think a hundred thousand will do. I said, good. So I go raise another hundred thousand, right? So I hand the check to Stanley because he couldn't, you know, accountants, accountants can't sell. Anyway, so I, I give him the hundred thousand dollars. Says, "Will this take care of the problem?" And Stanley said, "Yes." It took care of his problem. He paid Ooh. off his, he paid off his investors. Oh. So we're just, we're still broke. We had no money. Stanley hits the road, and that's how we went down. Stealing Stanley. I love that guy. He did oh. me the biggest favor of all. You know what I mean? I learned so much, man. What I was learned. the greatest lesson you learned from that big success slash failure? Well, just because they're smart doesn't mean they're not dishonest or crook. And I've, I've run into more crooks. You know, I think I hired them on t intention. <laughs> Until you learn your lesson, right? No, no. Every, every, per, every entrepreneur I've talked to have had somebody steal from them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I go to my doctor and this little cute little cutie working for him, this beautiful young woman, you know, as sweet as everybody loved her, da 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 da. And then, so one day I went and said, Well, where is she? And he goes, they don't, Where is she? Well, what she did, because she's tech savvy, she rigged the invoicing on their computer. So, you know, twenty not, you know, like ninety percent went to the doctor and ten percent went to her. Wow. And so she heisted. I said, that little sweetheart? He goes, smart. <laughs> and then so he, he called the police. And th this was the interesting part. Her father was already a rich guy. Mm. And he comes in and says, I'll pay you anything. Just don't send her to jail. Wow. So then that was the next thing you'll learn. Is it better to send her to jail or take, take the take money? The money. You know, wow. So, she, so she's in jail. No, no, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> but what? <laughs> what I'm saying is you can't teach that stuff. Yeah, you got to experience it. You got to go yeah, through it. It's, it's right in front of you all the time. I think when hope gets gut punched the way it has for folks right now, um, the, 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 the answers fall, a lot of them fall in the category of this is not going to last forever uh, because there's this sense yes. that, you know, stock market's down. Do I take my investments out? Well, only if you think it's going to stay down forever. Right. Because, uh, you know, you're, you're 35. You're going to be investing for 30 more years. You don't think it's going to come up in 30 more years? I mean, really, you're predicting the end of America? I mean, that's, that's silly. But your emotions tell you lies when, when they're based in fear. And when they're based in anger and they tell you lies and, and they tell me lies, we believe those lies in situations like this. So, uh, you know, you, I lost my job. I know, but that's happened before and, and probably happen again. Just get you another one. 
Well, there's, 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 yeah, there's a lot of people hiring right now. <laughs> there They're are hiring, a lot of people hiring. Amazon, Amazon's hiring 100,000 people right now. Yeah. So, I mean, there's jobs. It may not be the one you want, but you can get some food. Yeah. Uh, I mean, get you a leaf blower and rich people are afraid of leaves. You know, I mean, you can make some money. So <laughs> there, there's some stuff to do out there. But the, uh, 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 so the thing that the sense that, that, that the thing you're afraid of is going to last longer than it is. Yeah. Uh, whether it's the actual virus, whether it's the shutdowns, whether it's the economic repercussions of the shutdowns, whether it's the employment situation, uh, whether it's the quarantine, mm -hmm. it, it feels like it's going to last forever. But I mean, the chances of you being in the exact situation you're in, in a few months is almost zero. Yeah. Your life is not a snapshot. You're not trapped in this moment. It's a film strip. The story's yeah. going to continue to unfold. Yeah. And, and so that, that, when hope takes a gut punch, though, we, and we get down in that fear or we're mad or we're what, however it is we manifest that stuff, that those negative things, we, the emotions that we all have in these situations, that's where a lot of my questions are coming. They're all built in that. And I'm spending all my time going, uh, yeah, but it's not going to last forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's not going to last forever. Uh, yeah, but let's visit this in May. I think you're going to be okay. Uh, by June, are you even going to remember this? It's the great toilet paper shortage of the spring. You know, I don't know. I mean, wh what is it? You know, it, it's, you know, some people are going to have devastating, horrible mm -hmm. things that are going to be life changing, but that that's a very small percentage compared to the number of that are worried about it. Yeah. And so, you know, you, and you're going to get out of it. You're going to get you're out gonna of be it. You're going to be okay. Most, I mean, you're, you're going to be okay. Gonna I be like, okay. I like preacher Dave, man. This is a, you should just be a preacher <laughs> show. You know, I like this. What is the worst investment people should be making during this time? And what's the best investment they can make? Um, in my life, when I have become desperate right after that's when I become stupid. <laughs> yeah. And, Explain. The other, one, a, is, the other one is story. when I get, well, when, you know, when you get scared mm -hmm. and you go rushing towards something out of fear, that sense of desperation, this ah, thing, when you do that, you're getting ready to screw up. Mm. I mean, just count on it. Uh, and the other time you do that is if you're greedy. Uh, if you think you, okay, I got this one. I can take advantage of this. And uh, I mean, greedy as a lack of virtue greedy i don't mean greedy in a a positive way where mm -hmm. i'm being ambitious okay mm -hmm. i mean the negative sides of greed and so if you're functioning in desperation or in this no holds barred i i'm going to just clean up on other people's pain thing that's when you're getting ready to screw up and you're getting ready to make a major mistake and and so you're set up also for con artists when you do that mm. um and so if you're, if you're functioning in high emotion, your brain just doesn't work good. My friend Art Laffer says well, people, when you're panicked and when you're drunk, you don't make good decisions. And so, you know, you, you're, when you're on high emotion, your brain is, it's your critical thinking skills shut down. And, and so that's when I've made the biggest mistakes in my life is when I was desperate and the few times that I was greedy where I thought, oh, I'm going to slip in there and that's going to mm. be easy money. Well, what, what was that? Easy money. Can you share a story of one of those greedy times where you tried to jump in and yeah, a buddy of mine, a buddy of mine, I was in my twenties and a buddy of mine was buying gold. And, uh, now this is in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a million years ago and he's buying gold <laughs> and he had this friend that was a gold, he was a gold bug. He was picking gold. And this guy had picked the gold prices where they were going within a dollar, uh, like 14 times in a row. And so, uh, we both dropped five grand into this thing. And if we had hit, it was a, it was a margin deal. And so I would have made 50 grand and I thought I'm putting five thousand bucks in here. I'm gonna make 50 grand, but it's a margin play, which means you're either going to make 50 grand or you're gonna make zero. Mm. And so he picked it right 14 times. The time I got in the 15th time missed it. I got zero turned 5,000 bucks into zero instantly. Last time I bought gold, last time I played stuff on margin, last time I got greedy. Was there, is there ever a time where, so what's the difference between greed and a great opportunity of being ambitious? Can you well, make money? I, can you make money fast in certain things or is typically most things take a certain amount of time and energy and effort? 
the vast majority of people who are successful financially and successful have done it incrementally. Uh, there's very few people who you see a, a meteoric rise in their wealth or their success that keep it. And there, I, I think because you build your character along the way to be able to hold mm -hmm. on and, and be able to do it. I think that's, that's my theory on it. Uh, I mean, I got rich quick. I started with nothing. And by the time I was 26, I had $4 million worth of real estate. I built a house wow. of cards, you know, and I had a million dollar net worth. I made $250,000 in 1984. I was making 20,000 bucks a month. And in my 20s. So, I mean, but you thought I had it all figured out. Meteoric rise to the top. But the very thing that caused me to be the, the incredible overdrive of ambition uh, caused me to go so fast uh, that, I, that I missed the blind spots. I missed the detour signs. I missed the bridge out signs. And so I built this house of cards I thought was a stone house but I was naive and didn't know. And along comes some regulations changes, mm -hmm. a few shifts in the economy, uh, a little SNL crisis and it all comes down. Yeah. Uh, you know, all of a sudden Dave looks like an idiot instead of a genius. Right. Uh, and so it turns out I was a little of both because you don't build something like that at 25 if you're not somewhat of a genius, but I was obviously an idiot in the way I built it. And so I get to do it again, get the, oppor the, the wonderful opportunity to start over. And, <laughs> and so, build the uh, right way. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, in the midst of that, as I was falling, over, it took two and a half years to lose everything we own. I had stuff presented to me. I almost got conned, serious con, like people just a real con artist type guy. I don't, there's not many of them out there. Right. You, most of the time you get screwed by well-meaning ignoramuses, but these, these were real con artists coming into my path and I was about to give them money because I so desperately needed to turn quick money into big money to save myself. I was desperate. And right about the time you get desperate is when you get stupid. So don't, don't make those decisions. So there's not really, so what I'm hearing you say is the wealthy, wealthy people, it takes time and it's incremental. It's not an overnight thing. It's not a quick rise. There might be some spikes here and there, but it's typically over time. It's okay to take a spike, yeah. but anytime I get a spike, I'm always a little suspicious of it. Really? Um, it makes me, it makes me even more careful. I draw back and I go, well, that's really cool. Is it okay? You know, because it's not normative. Normative is incremental. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I always tell entrepreneurs, it's okay to be on the cover of Slow Company magazine. The biggest crisis coming up right now after this pandemic is pensions are going to crash. That's right. You mm -hmm. got it. Now. Yeah. Thanks. For why, why are they going to crash? Because they're empty. Wall yeah. Street looted them. My God, wake up. Wake up. You know, there's a better book than that. It's called The Creature from Jekyll Island by, by uh, G. Edward Griffin. It's a big book. Get it on audiobook. And listen to it, you know, a couple of, a couple of th 10 minutes a night or something. The Federal Reserve has only one, prop, only one purpose, is to keep the rich rich. That's their only job. So every time the market crashes, as you notice, money pumps in. They pump the market. They pump the prices up. The rich exit. And the poor and middle class who listen to Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman, and their advice is good for the middle class. Don't get me wrong. They're told to invest for the long term. Okay, so what's happening to the poor and middle class with their 401k and IRA right now are set? That's like saying, okay, put the handcuffs on on the Titanic. It's going down. Meanwhile, the, the rich have got their G5 flying in to pick them up and get off the boat. <laughs> They're out. <laughs> <laughs> right, because <laughs> the problem isn't in the stock market. The pro you know, the problems in the repo market, mm. corporate credit market, the consumer uh, commercial paper market. They don't tell you that. They don't teach you that in school. So suddenly, voila! You know, in September, the corp, the shadow banking, which is corporate credit and the um, commercial paper and the commercial, I mean, the corporate credit and commercial paper market started to go bad in September. Oh, <gasps> suddenly! pandemic oh that was interesting funny how that appeared you know mm. so i'm not saying the pandemic isn't real i'm saying the real crisis it's a smoke screen for the real crisis going on right now mm. they're stealing your wealth through your pensions your 401k your ira through social security through your taxes through medicare 
That's why we have socialism kicking in right now. We have Bernie Sanders and AOC and Elizabeth Warren, hardcore socialists. But if you can see, if you, understand, if you really have a financial education, we're going from capitalists, which I am, and nothing wrong with the socialists. You know, there's, there are some people, 80, 20% of the people need to be given money because they're that you know, unable, whatever, for whatever reason, they're not able to. So we should give some people money, but not everybody. Mm-hmm. So we're going from capitalism to Bernie Sanders socialism and Hillary and all those guys. And then we're actually going to communism. And you can see it right now because Boeing is asking for a bailout and all these guys asking for bailouts. But this time the Fed's going to take percentage ownership. Really? Yes, that's communism. Central control of the economy. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's coming. But that's what they should teach us in school. And our school teachers, most of them are socialists, most are, and some of them are communists. They want the government to tell us what to do. They're really fascist. You know, they're really fascist. A fascist wants to tell you what to do. So you look at this, look at this stuff, what's it called, social distancing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's, you've taken away the First Amendment, mm. the right to assemble. PC, political correctness is freedom of speech. That's what's going on. And then they're printing money under all this scheme. Mm. So if you study real world PC-ness, we've lost our freedom of speech. Mm. That's what Stalin took away. And social distancing is the right to assembly, which is why there was a revolutionary war back in 1776. You know, the, the, uh, the Americans were, had to go hide in a church because the British would kill them if they were caught on assembly. Wow. History repeats. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but you know, most mm-hmm. people are taught this. Yeah. That's why I love going to military school versus university. They teach a lot of history, probably. We're taught military history. Mm-hmm. You know, history is bullshit. You know, through the victor goes history. You know, so the person that writes his, wins the war writes history to justify their position today. Oh. You know, it's called his story. <laughs> you know, the loser doesn't get to tell their story. <laughs> that's funny. So anyway, that's where we're at. And yeah. I just leave it to your generation. You guys are in the best position ever because you're still young. You're tech savvy, which, and the baby boomers aren't. So they're all, a lot of them are feeble and they're gone. We're yeah. Gone. So you guys have the world ahead of you. And use this time to be creative and, and yes. take action and be bold. And I think I saw something about in 2008 to 2010, some of the greatest companies or the biggest companies of today were started then Airbnb, uh, Uber, hey. uh, you know, all these other uh, companies. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. 2009. Wow. See, I love Bitcoin. You know What's why? your thoughts on cryptocurrency? Why do you love Bitcoin? Listen, Bitcoin is open source. The Fed can't touch it. Mm. You don't like the Fed? <laughs> the creature from Jekyll Island, the Fed. The Fed is not a bank. It's a cartel. Mm. Called by the richest guys on earth. Okay, You guys just wake up, you know. So anyway, the Fed is a cartel. So when I saw Bitcoin come out, it's open source. It's people's money. Gold and silver are God's money. So I, my whole objective is I go through my system of business, but I'm buying gold and silver. I store it in, in other countries legally because you can't just move that stuff. You have to move it legally and declare it. Mm-hmm. So I move my money legally. I want to get out of this country. So I keep my wealth outside this country, not because of my government, it's because there's so many people, you're gonna see lawsuits are gonna go up because people are desperate. They don't have any money. So when the economy gets mm. bad, that's why, you know, have you been in an accident? Have you been hurt? Let me, I'll come out, sue them for you. So if you don't have the right corporate, corporate entity like LLCs, C corporations, S corporations, offshore accounts, you got money is gonna be stolen. Mm. It's the real game. Okay. Your pensions, you watch, in a few years, oh, he did tell us our pensions are gone. You know what's going to happen? They're going to bail them out again. Mm. Because if you read this book here, <laughs> The 
creature, it says bailout is the name of the game. Mm. You know, back in the 80s, there was a guy named Neil Bush. Let's see, the Bush family. George, George, Silverado Savings. When, when, when uh, Neil Bush got in trouble, George and George bailed him out. Yeah. Got the game. <laughs> What's, I mean, you say there's two different types of pensions. What's the difference between a normal pension that someone would get and a defined benefit? plan yeah. pension what's and why should people be aware of these things well defined benefit is industrial age that was my poor dad's you know so what happened is i, I got a job with ford motor company and i get defined benefit which meant defined benefit means you got a paycheck for you for life mm -hmm. but they promise you a thousand dollars a month to get that for the rest of your life guaranteed well the problem was as you know right around in the 70s that's when china and japan and all my japan and germany came on so they had to get rid of pensions because pensions are drag on the, on the business. Mm. So they came up with a thing called ERISA, which today is known as a 401k. So a 401k type is a defined contribution. So you have defined benefit, which is industrial age, defined corporation is the 401k co contribution. So defined contribution means you only get what you put in. If it's not enough there, aloha, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not our problem today so I meet all these millennials who go, oh, I have a 401k and I said do you like bending over and picking up the soap you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> you know, I go, they don't know the difference yeah because you know what a 401k means fees 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 mutual funds fees 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 your money is stolen right out of your pension Mm. Defined benefit, defined contribution. So defined contribution 401k is information age pension. It mm. came about in 1974, just as, I, just as the baby boomers were entering the workforce. So today, the average baby boomer's 401k has $65,000 in it. The guy with a, four, with a defined benefit, their, their annual, you know, they have something like a million in it. Wow. The trouble is they're empty. Mm. That's what Who's Told My Pensions about my co-author's name, Ted Sedell. He was an SEC attorney and he became a whistleblower because he saw how much Wall Street was sucking the cash. Wow. Pensions. So that's who must told my pension. So he then became, he, he made, I think, 39 million last year blowing the whistle on all these, on these um, Wall Street firms, Goldman Sachs and those guys. What can people be doing when they have this 401k or this pension already that's going to do nothing for them? What should they be doing? Well, what they should be doing is choosing their teachers wisely. Yeah. Because I can tell, you know, I don't need money. Like, I write a book, right? And I get royalties from 50 different book companies throughout the world. Wow. So let's say I write a book. I make, like, they pay me $10,000 to the right to publish my book. I have zero expenses, but I collect royalties for the rest of my life. I'm still collecting huge royalties off of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So I created my own assets. I don't need an ETF. Mm -hmm. I created a cash flow board game, which unfortunately sold out right now. But every time somebody buys one, I get a royalty, whether I work or not. Yeah. And then I, I borrow money. I buy real estate. And then I use the accounting laws, appreciation, depreciation, amortization, and pay no taxes. Trump doesn't pay taxes either. That's why he won't show his financials. Wow. So you don't pay any taxes right now. Is it because of debt? Is that the main reason? or Because taxes are incentives. Taxes are, government wants you to do certain things. For example, if I donated, when I donate money to, let's say, P PBS Public Broadcasting, I got a tax break. Hmm. I donate money to the church, I got a tax break. That's what taxes are. So they tell you, if you do this, we'll give you a tax break. So if I have 500 employees, I get a tax break. If I have real estate because I'm providing housing, I get a tax break. So I use debt to buy real estate. And the more real estate I buy, the less tax I pay. Wow. So that's why Dave Ramsey, you know, I must, his, his, his advice is good for that person. But I need debt to buy the real estate so I don't have to pay any taxes. Mm -hmm. Now, real estate's going down right now. But that's why I have LLCs and C-corporations because 
then I, I, they can't get me because I'm, I'm protected by a corporate entity. Mm-hmm. And besides, if you read this book here, <laughs> the creature, you got to get the creature. They're going to, they're going to bail me out. So they already bailed me out. They just, they just said, how many employees do I have? So we, we calculated it up. So they're going to give me eight weeks of pay to pay my employees. Really? Actually, wow. Free money. So they'll bail you out. Wow. I love this country. <laughs> <laughs> you, you say, uh, don't be a, oh, go ahead. But you can't do that as an employee. Mm. Go to school, get a job. Your mindset is different than an employee. That's rich dad and poor dad. Yeah. Poor dad, employee. Rich dad, entrepreneur. Mm. That was the choice I had to make. <laughs> what if someone's not, like you said, someone's not entrepreneurial minded or they they don't have those skills? Can someone become an entrepreneur, um, or is it something you're born with? You shouldn't ask that. You know. All kinds of entrepreneurs, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, of course. There's drug dealers or entrepreneurs, hookers or entrepreneurs. There's a young girl who works in our neighborhood. She's a babysitter. She's an entrepreneur. You know? mm-hmm. So everybody can be an entrepreneur, hopefully be a legal one. Yeah. <laughs> the trouble is it's hard to make enough money if you're not a good entrepreneur. Mm. So uh, anyway, it's, it's just up here. Find the teachers. Find the right teachers. You, you say, don't be a saver, be an investor. Should people be investing even during these times if they're not comfortable doing that? Or this is the greatest time to invest is what I'm hearing you say because of the opportunity. Why, why would you save? Fear. No, but you know, that, was, that worked before <clears throat> 1971. You know, they printed $4.5 trillion after 2008. They estimate they're going to print another six to eight trillion, maybe ten trillion. Wow! After twenty twenty, at the same time they're going to pay zero zero interest rate policy. So you're saving money while the Fed's printing money, and they're going to pay you no interest on it. Why would you save it? Mm. So that's that's all I say, and so that's why when Susie talks about saving and Dave <clears> talks about <throat> saving, I wouldn't do that. But for the average person, they should do that. So that's why choose your teachers wisely. Right. You just have to know money. That's all. Yeah. And, and what's your prediction with real estate over the next few years? Do you think it's going to keep going down now? Or do you think it's like in LA, I feel like it hasn't gone down at all. It's like the place is, continues to grow, but eventually it's got to, right? I wouldn't invest in LA for one reason, taxes. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just wouldn't. I, that's your choice. You know, people say it's a nice place to live and it is. But I don't like paying taxes. Mm-hmm. I don't move there. Plus, you have you have what's called uh, they, they try to pull it. Uh, I forget the name of it, but you can't raise the rent. Some people, so I don't like rank, it. rank control. Yeah. Great place to live, great lifestyle. But it's gonna we're gonna have the biggest crash. We're going into a depression right now. We're going right past recession into a depression. Really? Yeah. Wow. You can't have every business closing. And the stock market is going up, but like I said, the real problems in the repo, the shadow banking market, that's what they're trying to save because it's broke. They're going bankrupt in there. So the dollar is going to be strong because everybody, 80% of the debt is measured in US dollars. So everybody needs dollars to pay off their debt. I remember watching a clip of yours talking about 2008, 2010, that time frame where you made You said you made a lot of money in the last recession. And I think while while people are struggling to figure out, well, you know, I just got laid off. But how can I see this as an opportunity to make money when it seems like no one's buying anything or no one's investing in things? But why is a time like this a great time to make money? Well, it's a great time to be introspective and to pivot and to do resets. And to try stuff you never tried before. Yeah. Because you might as well, right? We're all sitting at home. We got to try something. <laughs> those free so, time, yeah. uh, I mean, we pivoted a whole bunch of product lines here at Ramsey and all kinds of things. And we could throw all these offerings out there. Stuff that we might have messed around with split tests for a year or whatever. Instead, we just dumped it on the street. Let's just try it. 
just see if we can help some people and give some people something to do while they're at home with some digital products. And so that's exciting. You may have a situation where you hated your job. I mean, statistics tell us that 68% of Americans hate their job. Uh, and some of you don't have that job anymore. So you get the opportunity to get one you like now. Yeah. Uh, and you might not have done that on your own. So this could be the best thing that ever happened to you. There's a lot of good that comes out of this much pressure uh, because it forces it forces you to reset. Yeah. It forces you to rethink. And, uh, you know, two or three, four crises ago, I don't know, back, I'm an old guy now, I, I had a personal crisis, you know, of losing everything. I decided I was never going to be the victim of the things I can control when one of these things that I can't control come at me again. And so we got out of that. And we built an emergency fund. And we were in the last downturn of 2008, we were in a position of, we had piles of cash. And so I was able to buy real estate at a nickel and a dime on the dollar. And it was a wonderful time. But there were other times I was broke and couldn't take advantage yeah. of stuff being on sale. But uh, if you're in a position, you got money right now, the stock market's on sale, real estate's not moved much yet. But if you're buying even consumer items other than toilet paper, most things are on sale. I know. How much, how much deeper down do you think this will take in terms of, you said real estate's not on sale yet, but it probably will be. How much farther down do you think things are to go and for how long with your, you well, know, just your guess on this? I mean, you know, weather forecasters and economists, the only people can be wrong all the time and still keep their job. So I have no idea, but I, I do know there's going to be a direct correlation between how long we stay out and how long it takes us to recover. Uh, no kidding. Uh, it's kind of common mm -hmm. sense. The obvious is every week that we're out, there's another series of businesses that will never reopen, mm -hmm. that will close. And so, and that's a, a recession is two consecutive quarters of the gross domestic product, all the goods and services produced in the U.S., shrinking rather than growing. That's all it is. It receded mm. rather than expanded. And so recession sounds like a big, scary depression type word, but it simply means two quarters. We've not had one quarter yet. Mm. Shrinkage. So it would have to be up into the fall before you can officially declare this a recession or, or what results in the, from the Corona shutdowns, a recession. So I don't know, but um, I, I, I'm sure hoping that, that the folks are not ill and that nobody dies yeah. and it's a horrible thing. And, uh, but the, the, but, and the juxtaposition with that is it, the sooner we can get back to work, uh, the fewer people are going to be, um, you know, affected by the economics of this. And it's not saying I'm trading a dollar for a life, but Today, actually, the, we've lost uh, about 100 jobs per case of corona right now. Wow. So the corona shutdown. about in America? In America? Or? In, in America, yeah. We've lost about, you know, the corona wow. shutdowns affected 100 families' jobs uh, for every case, uh, not, not death, for every case mm. uh, of the virus. And I don't want anybody to be sick. I don't want anybody to die. And I don't want the hospital bills and the beds and the ventilators to run out. I don't, I don't, want, any, I don't want any bad stuff. I don't, I don't, I'm not a medical person. Uh, but but I am an entrepreneur, and I'm you know every day we're uh, not working uh, is a trade off, and it, it is a good trade off because you don't want to kill people. Believe me, yeah. I'm not saying that. But but man, it's just it's painful to watch these people lose their businesses. Yeah, from your you, you mentioned you've been through three or four recessions. I don't want to I don't want to say your age out here, but it sounds like you've been I'm you've 60. been you've been around the block. You've experienced yeah. some stuff. You know, I only went through really. Uh, you know, I guess it was my adult life um, when I was 24, I guess it was the 2008 to 2009 mm -hmm. time, uh, time frame. And I was just got out of school and I was trying yeah. to figure out my life. I had three credit cards I was living off of. I yeah. was living on my sister's couch for a year and a half. I was in college debt and I didn't have any skills that I thought were usable to get a job or do anything. And when I look back, you know, 11, 12 years ago, that was actually the greatest time and the greatest gift for me to develop skills, to work hard, to hustle, to try to see how can I make a hundred dollars here and there and then turn that into a business. And it was the greatest, it was the hardest time and the greatest time for me. I'm curious with your experience in, in watching these in the, over the years, what were the greatest lessons you learned from each one that you applied in the last three weeks with your, your personal business? Well, it, it is cliche, but cliches come from truth that, um, you know, that, that, you know, it's the greatest time and the worst time in your life. Uh, you don't want to go back there. No. Good Lord. No, I don't want to go back there. I went bankrupt. I lost everything in my twenties. I don't want to go back there. 
but the lessons that I learned from that pain were so thorough. Mm. Uh, pain is a thorough teacher <laughs> yes. that, uh, you know, I, 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 it was a rich time. The fertilizer mm. was everywhere. Mm. Lots of places to grow stuff, you know, <laughs> lots of poop. So, you know, it, and, and that's, you know, that's what you had there in yeah. 2008. There weren't any jobs. You couldn't like, you could just, I mean, there was a, const a contraction of the economy, a recession, and you're there, you are on your citrus couch. And so you found out that the secret sauce in your life is the guy in your mirror. Mm -hmm. That it's not some outside variable that's going to come and save you. The Calvary's not coming. Santa Claus doesn't live in Washington, D.C. It's up to you, baby. Mm -hmm. Get up off the couch. I got to go leave the cave, kill something, and drag it home. You found that truth in that moment. I found that truth that, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, that old saying, I found that truth. And so nowadays, now that I've been through, uh, you know, Y2K or 911 or all these initials come at you, you know, the, 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 the horrible thing of 2008, now the Corona, I, the only thing I am sure is we're going to get through this. Yeah. You get hope because you go, it's not going to kill you. Well, I guess it, you could get the virus. I don't mean that, right. but I'm saying the, the economic stress that we're under, the fear that we have, the concern or the worry that we have, does not, you don't die from it, mm -hmm. you, but, but you feel, you feel like, <clears throat> like there's this hopelessness, and the truth is that's unfounded. The truth is there's a lot of reason to have hope. Uh, by September, where do you really think we're going to be? By this time next year, are you not 90-something percent sure that the economy will be roaring again and your life will be back to some level of normalcy? You think it's going to be 10 years for you to personally recover from this? No, that's absurd. And we, you know that once you've walked through several of them. And so it's just, to me, it's like, yeah, you're, you're going to make it. We're going to be okay. Yeah. And so your personal, I guess I'm just curious about your personal thoughts. Do you think to yourself, like, I'm fine because I've, I've followed my seven steps for years and I've got you know, cash and I feel safe and protected. So now how can I shift and adapt and pivot and serve my community and customers more? Or do you yeah. feel any, do you feel any anxiety personally at all or? Oh, no, none. No. I mean, I'm, we're, we're in fabulous financial shape. It's not a, yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of money invested in the stock market. It's going down. I'm gonna put some more money in while it's on sale. You know, I mean, it's, if real estate goes on sale again, I'll buy some more. So no, I mean, my personal stuff, it's, it's, uh, it's not arrogance. It's just, I've been doing this a long doing, time. You're the, you're the king of and it. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm the, I'm the little pig in the brick house, you know, I mean, up <laughs> and puff baby. And so, uh, but, but I do, it does put you in a position to serve then. And truthfully, you get more joy even in a crisis and serving than you do in sitting in the basement and counting your coins. I mean, so uh, the opportunity, I got a thousand folks on our team and, and it, you know, the struggle and the scratching and the scrappiness and the clawing to keep this place running and all of them not have their incomes interrupted in any way during this time. Uh, that's an act of service in leadership, uh, the act of service of uh, speaking hope and life into this uh, into the communities around America right now is an act of service on my part. Uh, it, it's, uh, being on the air three hours a day, the Dave Ramsey show and saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Over and over and over again. Right now, that's my job. That's what I do. Um, and it, it's there, it, that's just so much more satisfying than counting coins. Yeah. Now I followed your steps when I was, you know, 25, 26, when I started making some money, when I was like, it's hard to, it's hard to follow a step when you feel like you're, you're living off credit cards and in debt and you're oh, not yeah. making any money. So you feel like this sense of helplessness really and i know i've listened to a lot of your shows with people where they feel helpless and it takes that initial momentum to kind of kick start it and see little savings here and there and then pay off one thing here and there but i tell you once i finished those i guess really the the first five to six steps i don't have a home still i still uh rent for personal reasons but the first uh five to six steps and then building wealth and giving and giving once I got through these, it's just like, man, you feel so much more bulletproof. I feel so much more bulletproof now. After 10 years yeah. of building into this recession, I feel f safe. I feel fine. I feel protected. And uh, it gives me so much more peace of mind since I did follow your steps. So I would first want to acknowledge you for that, for creating something so simple for us and, and providing this three hours a day for everybody. I think it's amazing. You sound like a preacher and a motivational speaker to me in the last few minutes, just uh, <laughs> speaking life and hoping to us. So I appreciate that. Um, what are you telling the people right now who are saying, you know what, 
I didn't follow your advice. I didn't do what I should, I should have done. I, yeah. I still love off of credit cards. I overbought, paid for my house, and I've got this expensive lifestyle and credit cards that I, I know I'm wrong. I made a mistake. I own it, and now I'm screwed. And yeah. I just got 50% cut of my work. I might lose my job in two months. I got all these bills. Like, how do you even, how do you even respond to something like that? Yeah. Well, I certainly don't say I told you so. Uh, that's not, that's not yeah. the message because yeah. I've been there. I've done stupid stuff too, and that's not helpful. Uh, and it, it doesn't bring, it doesn't bring any healing. Uh, the thing is this, we all get wake up calls. Mm -hmm. We get wake up calls in our relationships, our spiritual walk, our leadership styles. We get wake up calls in our finances and some people, the phone's ringing off the hook right now. Uh, they're getting wake up calls on a bunch of things. Uh, they're at home with their family and it's, and they're starting to realize I was disconnected from my family. I haven't been plugged in. They got a wake up call on their relationships at home. They've gotten a wake up call on, you know, I, I don't have any savings and I've got, I'm deeply in debt. This isn't working. And so the, you know, the, the, the cool thing is when you get the call, then you have to make the choice. Are you going to answer the phone? And if you pick the phone up, that means maybe it's time to change. Mm. And uh, you can look back and you might be uh, 27 years old right now watching this and you're screwed. You lost your job. You got no money, you got no savings, and you feel like it's all over. Uh, and I remember in 1970, I was 10 years old and I was in my grandpa's backyard. We were tearing down an old deck and I pulled some nails out of those old boards as we were taking the boards off. And he taught me to put them down and straighten them with a hammer and save those used nails hmm. in a coffee can. Now, my grandpa Ramsey was one of my favorite people on the planet. This is 1970, and he was still answering the phone that rang in the Great Depression. Hmm. It changed his life. He was frugal and careful and wise with money the rest of his life. And so someday, 27-year-old, you're going to be sitting on the back porch with your grandkid. And you're going to remember back in alt 20, there was the coronavirus <laughs> and it changed my life, you know, and that you're going to be that guy. You're going to be giving dad jokes, you right. know, and grandpa jokes, right? Like I am now. And you're going to get that opportunity. I was 28 years old when I lost everything. It was my fault. It was the SNL crisis. The banking climate changed. I'd built a house of cards. I was stupid and the phone rang and it was my wake up call. Are you going to answer the phone? Are you going to change your life to where you say never again, I'm going to control the controllables to where I'm the little pig in the brick house. Never again. That may be the only thing you get out of this crisis. And if it is, you got enough. What's the lesson you've learned in the last two to three years that you thought you'd already learned? As you know, a, a rich dad, poor dad is a story of my rich dad who had no education, hmm. but he, he grew up in business for real. You know, he, he, he took over the family business at 13. So he kind of grew up in the real world of money. When my rich dad was a PhD, hmm. poor and helpless and desperate, went to Stanford North University in the <laughs> Northwestern, you know, a very smart guy, good guy in all this. But as you know, teachers don't know shit. Yeah. <laughs> the fact they teach stuff. They teach stuff they don't know nothing about. Right. Well, right. The, some of them are forced. To, I mean, they're forced to teach that, right? Some of them try to educate and, in other ways and inspire. Don't, don't defend them. Don't defend them. I don't like them. <laughs> anyway, you know what happens? When do I get in the most trouble? Is when I criticize going to school. Mm. Because to many people, it's their only hope and salvation. Yeah. So if I say, well, I don't think school teaches you much. I may as well piss on the Pope, you know, they said, I know religion. If, if you don't go to school and then it tell us, well, you know, Steve jobs dropped out. He did pretty good. Yeah. It's dropped out. Dell dropped Zuckerberg. out. Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg dropped out. Henry Ford, Walt Disney. They didn't, they, you know, they didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. No. So anyway, religion is, I mean, education is religion to most people. Yeah. 
So that's why I step on toes and I get dumb. Well, what, did, what did Mark Twain's quote say? Like, don't let schooling get in the way of your education or yeah, something like true. that. And the, one of the reasons why I started the School of Greatness, I was telling you before we started recording, is that I, I was in the special needs classes literally every day for as long as I can remember. Since kindergarten until seventh year in college, I had a tutor. I was in the special needs classes with a few kids who had learning disabilities. And it was the most challenging thing for me because I wish they would have taught me things that I'm learning now. And the reason I created the School of Greatness, because I was like, what are the things I wish they would have taught me in school to help me get ahead in my finances, to help me get ahead in my health, my mindset, my, you know, how to deal with uh, a breakup in a relationship, uh, a tragic time, like the, the emotional side of things, the, the education that I wish they would have taught us. I was like, I'm going to go create it. I'm going to find people like Robert and teach us the ways. So, you know, you're doing that through your, your work and I'm trying to do that. But I think there's people trying to do good by educating outside of the traditional school system where they're, I think they're more limited. Correct. And that's why I created the cash flow board game is because I learned that's about money great. playing. I learned about money playing Monopoly. Yeah. I learned more about life playing Monopoly than I did in four years of college. Yeah. I went to, I went to a really good school, you know, the best schools in the world, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And I came out a rich man, but it didn't teach me much about money. I was only a high paid employee. Yeah. So then I joined the Marine Corps. Then I have two professions. I can fly for United Airlines or I could sail for Standard Oil. I didn't want to either because it wasn't challenging anymore. Mm -hmm. I think if there's a lesson is that I, I'm looking for the challenge and some people are looking for security. They're two mm -hmm. different people. Mm -hmm. They're very, very, they're, they're extremely different people. Yeah, and you talk about, you know, uh, you know, rich favors the bold, those that are willing to take risks and willing to put themselves out there. Do you think you can get rich without taking risks and being bold and taking, you know, these big chances or can you keep this security mindset and really gain true wealth? Well, many people have, you look at Cuomo and all those guys, they were, they were born rich kids and their father. Right. You now Trump could have taken that path too. He was, he was born a rich kid. So it's not, it's, I think it's you're either an entrepreneur or you're not. Right. I think that's the difference. You know, what's interesting. I never thought I was an entrepreneur until I had a, a big wake up call, a tragic experience. And it was kind of like a perfect storm. I didn't know how to make a dollar. I was not like selling baseball cards. I didn't do the lemonade stand. I didn't try to hustle all this stuff as a kid. I literally maybe made a little bit of money in the summers just because my dad put me to work. And I had this dream of playing professional football. And then I made 250 bucks a week. My dad got in a tragic car accident. He was in a coma for three months. Um, I didn't have a college degree. It was 2008. The, the economy went down. Uh, I was living on my sister's couch. She was feeding me. I was making no money. I was living off three credit cards with student loans. And I didn't have my dad as that kind of financial safety net anymore because he wasn't able to help me and bail me out. So it was more like, what do I do? No one was hiring people with degrees at that time, even <laughs> master's degrees. I didn't even get a bachelor's degree yet. And I was just like, how do I survive? So it was, I don't think if the worst thing in my life would have happened, I want to be here learning how to be hungry, how to like say, I need to go survive right now and take chances. So I, I, think, I think that perfect storm mentality made me into this survivor, creative mindset, willing to risk it all. Whereas if I had my father to kind of protect me financially or say, because he was like, you're going to take over the business, you're going to come work with me. And that was my mindset. When he kind of left emotionally and mentally, he's still alive today, but not the same from the brain trauma. It made me step up as a human being, yeah. as a 24-year-old, and say, I got to learn some stuff. And that's why, that's why I say to young people today, look at this pandemic, this coronavirus pandemic, you know. It's really tragic because it attacks the old guys. Mm-hmm. But this, but even worse is the baby boomers had it the easiest of all generations, but now their, pension, their pensions are gone. Their 401ks are gone. Yep. Social security is broke. Medicare is broke. So I say to younger people, uh, this pandemic, this crisis is the best thing that ever happened to you. You know, you, you think about that iPhone. You have more power in that iPhone than I had with my Sparrow Univac mainframe computer. 
And then so when I meet people who say, oh, the economy is bad, I said, there's the only economy is between this ear and that ear. Mm. You know, there's an the economy out here. But this is the best time for your generation because you're tech savvy. I'm not tech savvy. Mm -hmm. You know, you got, this was made for you guys. The old guys like me are being cleaned out by the pandemic. <laughs> Unless you have a lot of assets that are bringing you in cash. The way is clear for you. Now, the old guys are gone. They're dead. Right. What are you going to do about it? You know, so it's really a great time. But exactly as you were talking about, the bad times are leading to the best times. That's it. Yeah. If you can see it. But some, unfortunately, as you know, there's a lot of your generation and younger, they'll never recover. Yeah. They're going to see this as the worst of times. I know. And they're going to, they're going to reflect back to this in five years and 10 years and say, that's a thing that screwed me up or hurt me and, and be a victim to it as opposed to saying, okay, this is happening and how can I make the most of it? And what's it going to take for me to learn a new skill or get more creative or be hungrier in this time? Or, and that's, or, or more important, who's your teachers? Mm, who are you listening to? Well, you know, that's why I keep saying to the young, the millennials, you know, they're a pack of wimps, you know? I meet millennials who are just horrifyingly weak. <laughs> Snowflakes, I call them. You know, yeah. they go to college and they're taught, they're taught trigger events or whatever. You know, the, the, I don't know what they say today, but they've got to have special rooms where there's no whatever. I'm going, holy mackerel. <laughs> Welcome to the real world, you know. And there's other millennials who are as tough as nails. I mean, this is the biggest opportunity they've ever had. Huge. So it just depends upon what's between this here and this here, what's mm -hmm. in the heart. That's it. Yeah. For the, uh, what do you think is the, the, num the next step, the first step or the number one step for the average person with, you know, the kind of the normal job that they might be losing, if they have s some debt, they got some credit card. What's the next step for them to not only survive, but thrive in this market in this time? Well, I always say quit your job. But that's not, you know, I don't have a job. I never, I've, I've only had one job. And I never wanted a job after that because I had to be hungry. Mm. Not to say, you know, but it, it, we're all different. We're humans, we're different beings. If, if I show you this diagram here, you know, this, it's why I created my cash flow board game. Mm -hmm. Because we have four different intelligences. We have mental intelligence. We have, I don't know what that one is, physical intelligence. You probably have very good physical to make, mm -hmm. you know, all and all that. Yeah. Emotional intelligence, but spiritual intelligence. So I went to military mm. school in New York. The first thing is spiritual. You know, I become a Marine. It's spiritual. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you, you're putting your life on the freaking line. Yeah. You know, so Nazim Taleb, you know, wrote the book, The Black Swan. He also wrote uh, Anti-Fragile. He says there's three kinds of people in the world. There's fragile, and that's what our school systems are putting out, fragile, mm -hmm. MB, snowflakes. And that's your choice. You want to be that way? Have a good life. Mm -hmm. The second type is that so a fragile is like a champagne flute. Yep. You hit it, it shatters. Then the second one is called robust, and a robust person is like the rock. You know, you can pound on them, dump on them. Yeah. They take it. But... That's all they do. They take mm. it. And then anti-fragile is somebody like you where they pound the crap out of you and you get smarter and better because of it. Mm -hmm. So I love Nazim Taleb. You know, a lot of people call him Dr. Doom. But the way I look at this whole thing, this economy is we're, we're probably going into a depression. You know, we're not going to get out of this. One. Really? Oh, yeah. And so the thing is, is this good for you or bad for you? I'm looking forward to it. You know, the last, the last crash was 2008. <clears throat> and I made more money in 2008 than in my whole life. So this one here, 2000, you know, what is it, 2020? I'm going to get even richer. But yeah. other people are going to get poor. And if they're baby boomers, they're going to blame it on this coronavirus. Oh, my health. You know, the, hey, hit the road. Put on some running shoes. Change your diet. Get some mm -hmm. sunlight. You know, get healthy. Don't, get, don't be a wimp. But, oh, no, I'm so afraid of dying. I'm going, you're already dead. You don't even know it yet. You know, <laughs> in the Marine Corps, you know, in the Marine Corps, we used, we used to call them corpse people. Right. Okay. Corpse, not core. Yeah. A corpse man. No, a corpse man. A corpse man is a person who's dead but doesn't know it. <laughs> wow. They're so afraid of dying. They're already dead. Yeah. 
It's about and taking the, action, the taking best, control of your life, taking control of your health, your finances, everything. This is the best time to be alive right now. I did an interview with uh, Dave Ramsey uh, last week, and he said, yep. you know, the last three or four recessions or down economies, whatever you want to call it, crashes, he said, I made more money during those times than I do in, in good times. Yep. So I'm hearing him say that. I'm hearing you say that. How did you make more money then, and how are you planning to – turn this into an opportunity to make more money now for you? What are the things, the actual like action steps? Is it investing more in the stock market? Is it real estate? Is it buying other assets? What does that look like for you? Well, now the lesson is here, you got to choose your teachers wisely. When the market crashed in 2008, guess how much money I borrowed? A lot. 300 million. No way. From what? private investors, the bank, or how does that, how does that work? Because interest rates were dropping and real estate prices were going to the toilet. And when I walk into my banker, this is what Rich Dad Poor Dad is about. Rich Dad Poor Dad is about a financial statement. Mm -hmm. Income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flow. It's a book on accounting. People don't even know it's a book on accounting. So I walked into my bank with my partner and had all this property that was floating to the surface. And I say, I'll take them off your hands. I just give me, give me the money to buy the property. Wow. That's cojones. 300 million. Give me the money and I'll buy your properties for you. <laughs> That's crazy. So it depends. And this is my whole thing. I'm now 700 million, almost a billion in debt. Really? You know why? Because I don't pay any taxes. The more debt I have, the less tax I pay. And the average guy goes, how do you do that? Because you have bad teachers. And so it's this whole thing that you got to choose your teachers wisely. That's why I wrote the book, Fake, Fake Money, Fake Teachers, Fake Assets. I don't touch that garbage that Wall Street puts out. I don't have a 401k. I don't have stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. Doesn't mean you shouldn't, but I don't need them. Okay? Right. right. And the other part is, look, for you young guys, the best teachers are not in colleges. The best teachers are on YouTube. The mm -hmm. best teachers are on YouTube. Wake up. You know, this guy, George Gammon, he's fantastic. Patrick Beth David. Mm -hmm. fantastic you know he's great Jim records the fake teachers are in colleges and they're telling you to get a job right up the carpet ladder you know patrick beck david said it the best <clears throat> and i love that guy he says there's two kinds of leaders wartime and peacetime and a peacetime leader is a guy like my poor dad he goes through all the right schools he has all the pedigrees the credentials he does all the right things he climbs the corporate or the government ladder and all that or a wartime leader goes to, goes to war. So Jobs, Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. a wartime leader. I'm a wartime leader. The difference is I went to war. I went to war twice on the front lines. Yeah. And I changed. What happened? So I joined the Marine Corps. I go to flight school in Pensacola. I learned to fly. I go to Camp Pendleton. I strap on my weapons. I go to advanced weapons in Camp Pendleton. I go to Okinawa. And then they sent me into Vietnam. And I, I came out of Vietnam about four months later back to, to back to restage in Okinawa. And I thought everybody had changed. I looked at the uh, fellow Marines and I thought they were, and it wasn't that they were, I had been to war. <laughs> you got tougher. You no, got no, stronger. I'm just, it's different. When, when somebody's trying to kill you, every single mission, I went down three times. No way. Yeah. And I came back stronger and tougher. So I come back to Okinawa, I, I got like a week off. And they're going to ship me back into Vietnam again. I said, what happened to these guys? And it wasn't that they changed, I changed. So what happens to entrepreneurs who go out and they get their ass handed to them and they survive, if you survive, you see the world differently. And so that's mm. what happened to you when you get injured and all this. Yeah. You see a different world. Whereas some um, peacetime who's climbing the corporate ladder right now, they just lost their job. They're sucking their thumb. You know, this is the worst time for them. Yet for a wartime leader, this They're crisis, excited. They're excited about it. Yeah. It's the best of times. Yeah. If, if you're an entrepreneur right now, the world's open to you. If you're an employee, your world's dead to you. What if Yeah. An entrepreneur can create their own success. Yeah. What advice... Oh, you know, sorry. Go ahead. It's a job. Mm. They're a peacetime warrior. Remember, see, watch Patrick Beck David, you know? He's great. Wartime leader, peacetime leader. Which one are you? You know, I mean, no, that's, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, that's true. So this is the best of times for the wartime guys.
horrible yeah. time for peacetime. Right. And, and for the people that are the wartime people, what is the, the best advice you would give them now for the next year, two years to capitalize on how do they make more money? How do they make their millions during this time? What would you say? You can't, you can't make money now. You should hang it up. I, I, I tell all you freaking millennials, man, you got, you know, I don't know where it is. I got, I got this iPhone. If you yeah. can't make money with that, hang it up. You know, like we used to say, hang up the jock strap. You're yeah. not going to make the team. <laughs> you can't make money with an iPhone through social media, through marketing. You have the world at your fingertips and you can't make money. The problem is between this year and this year. It's not out here. It's in here. That's why you've got to choose your teachers wisely. Yeah. You know, so let me just say it again. The best teachers are on YouTube. So is the best porno. Take up your mind. Make up your mind what you want to listen to. You know right. what I mean? We have I, a choice. So you know, I, I'm just being real. To you. I hear you, man. No. I hear, I hear you. What's, what's the best investment people can make then to, to oppor- uh, capitalize on this opportunity is the investment in education left ear look if you're poor right now it was called look in the mirror that's mm. what I've always said to me says if you're looking in the mirror right now and you see a loser that's what you are mm. you can't make money in this economy you better change your thinking you know the, you know hindsight is 2020 as i said yes yes so i was if you're looking you know you don't have any money you don't have a job your boyfriend or girlfriend has left you. And uh, then they go, so well, how did I get here? How did I get here? There was a, there was a great book called, uh, you know, Gulag Archipelago by Sultzenetsen. So he gets thrown in this in a um, concentration camp or a gulag in Siberia. And he says, how did I get here? You know how he got there? Because he was a peacetime leader. Mm didn't fight back. So people are being sold to bill. Go to school, get a job, pay taxes, mm-hmm. save money, get out of debt, buy a house, your house is an asset, and invest for the long term in a well-defined portfolio of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. And I do none of that. And why do you recommend the opposite? Because I don't have to do that crap. That's that's Kool Aid. Go to school, go to school. What do they teach you about money? Nothing. Get a job. You pay the highest taxes. Pay your taxes. I don't pay taxes. Get out of debt. Well, debt money is debt after 1971. If you know your history of money, your house is not an asset. Your house is a liability. And why would I invest for the long term in the stock market when I can make my own assets? I don't need the stock market. I'm not saying you shouldn't, mm-hmm. but I create my own assets. I create my own cash flow. Every you mean, day, I can. You mean through your, you mean through your business, through your, your, right, your creativity. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. Most people are employees. They're looking for jobs. I'm just looking for. So, like right now, should entrepreneurs invest in in the stock market? You think if you're an entrepreneur, you should invest. In- look, find a stupid teacher who's going to tell you what to do. <laughs> I'm asking your opinion. I'm curious as a teacher. I, I don't give advice. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't follow Warren Buffett either. Mm. You know why? Because he invests the money. Why would I let him invest my money? I want the fun. So what's the, what's the investment you make the most in? Look, please hear what I'm saying. Yes. I made a fortune in 2008. Mm-hmm. 2020, I'm making more money. I'm paying less taxes. It doesn't mean I don't have problems, but I'm prepared for this. My biggest problem right now is because everybody's taking a vacation. I can't get enough product. Mm. I'm selling out. You know, my cash flow game is sold out. It's selling out constantly all over the world. All over the world, I get royalties from my book sales. My book sales are going through the roof right now. So I'm making more money. Information, yeah. There's two kinds of discipline. There's internal or self-discipline. And then there's external discipline. So right now, if the world's kicking your butt, that's external discipline. Mm. And if you're self-disciplined, the world's kissing your butt right now. It's up to you. So that's why I love the Marine Corps. That's why I love going to military school and not a university. Because I got my ass kicked every single freaking day. Mm. The first word I had to learn at the, Marine, at the academy, mission. 
mission is spiritual. Mm. What's your mission? And my mission has always been to serve people. Most people, all they give a fuck is making money mm. and screwing people. That's called the Federal Reserve Bank, Wall Street, and all that. I want nothing to do with them. So I just don't play their game. But you have to get smarter not to play their game. So that's why YouTube has the best, te best teachers. This guy, George Gammon, man, he's a great, great teacher. Patrick McDavid, fantastic teacher. You know, this, uh, Cardone, fantastic teachers. So choose your teachers wisely. That's, all I, that's what I say, because I, I have to choose between my rich dad and my poor dad. Mm -hmm. My poor dad, PhD, poor, helpless, and desperate. This is what I love about you is your uh, leadership on a certain standard for the human beings you surround yourself with and who are part of your, your mission. And I think it's really inspiring. And I look up to that. I'm curious, how do you teach character for people that don't have what you want yet? And maybe not everyone's at the level you want, but how do you, can people change their character over time? And how do you shift that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a decision. You can just decide. Um, I mean, think about it. What's integrity? Integrity. I can just decide I have it. Yeah. And now I do. Mm -hmm. And I start acting out of the fact that I am a person of high integrity. Uh, I'm a person who's dependable. I'm a person you can count on. I got your six. I got your back. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cut your throat from behind. Uh, and you can just decide to be that today. Maybe you were the world's worst gossip before, and none of your friends could count on anything except you slitting their throat from behind. But you can just decide, just like that, to change. And so it's, it's a wonderful decision. In Christianity, we call it repentance. You're walking one way, you stop, you turn, you walk the other way. That's all it is. You turn around. You do, you do a turnaround. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, for most of us, it's a journey. Uh, you don't do it instantaneously. Uh, I can decide to control my tongue. I can decide to speak life over people rather than death and filth over them. I can decide that. Uh, I don't always do it right. Uh, I just told you a minute ago, sometimes I'm a jerk, right? Uh, so, but it's a, and we don't, by the way, we don't have any perfect people working here. Mm -hmm. We have people that are trying. You're not perfect, That's Dave? All. We have no, <laughs> just read the articles, okay? But, the, <laughs> but, the, but now the, uh, the, I mean, the, that, the thing is we got people that are trying. Yeah, they're, they're humble in the sense that they know they're not. But we're listen, we aspire to be people that can be counted on. Mm. We aspire to be people of value. We aspire to be people of noble character. And, and uh, when we don't, then we know that we didn't. But most people just go along and their language is filthy and their life is filthy. And then they wonder why they're not attractive. And they wonder why they're not winsome and the opportunity does not come to them. Uh, it's because opportunity runs from that. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't want to do deals with people they can't count on who are crooks. Uh, they don't want to do deals with people who, uh, you know, run around on their wife. Because if you run around on your wife, you're probably going to mess me over in a business deal. I mean, you know, so I, this is a lack of character. Uh, and so I'm always leery when I run into that out there in the marketplace, when we're doing deals, we're hiring a vendor, we're bringing somebody on the team, we're interacting with new friends we have and so forth. And I, it's not that I'm being judgmental. i just want to be wise mm. because, you know, you become who you hang around with for sure. Your speech yeah. patterns, you read the same books, you have the same thought patterns, you're hopeful or fearful based on who you run around with, what your inputs, mm. um, you know, you, you, we know this because those of us that raise kids, we don't let our kids run around with ju juvenile delinquents because right. we know they'll come home acting like juvenile delinquents. Hello. Right. <laughs> so, and adults aren't any different. They're the same thing. I read the same books my best buds read. I, I'm, I think the same way they think. And so I have to be careful. Who are my, who's my inner circle? Who's my posse that, that's mm -hmm. influencing Dave? And so that's the kind of stuff we're doing. And you know, as a person of faith, that means I'm going to church on Sunday. And uh, it's not because they have some kind of magic pill down there. Uh, it, it's cause I need to be connected to God cause I'm not going to get this by myself. Otherwise that's the way I view it. And yeah. that's what we do around here. I'm curious. I asked, uh, I've got about a uh, seven or eight, six or seven minutes left with you. I got a few questions left. Uh, I asked a question, the rock Dwayne Johnson had a uh, Instagram live over the weekend. And I asked him a question wow. on Instagram live his first Instagram live. And I asked him a question 
just uh, via the text, but he said, Lewis Howe's great question, and he responded to oh, it. Oh, wow. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to ask you the same question. And I'm, <laughs> I'm curious your response. The question to him was um, two questions that he answered. One, what was the greatest lesson that your father taught you? So I'll let, I'll let you uh, answer that one first. What's the greatest lesson that your, your father taught you? My dad was in the real estate business when I was growing up and was a student of all the great uh, sales trainers and positive thinkers of that day. So, I mean, we had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Zig Ziglar, Earl Nightingale, mm. Paul Harvey, Cavett Robert, Charlie Tremendous Jones. And uh, he infected us, my dad did, infected my, my sister and I with the belief that uh, we can do anything. I really believe I can do anything. Um, now I, I, that not, not within, I mean, I guess within, I, I'm not going to be in the NBA. Okay. I'm not going to play right. in the NFL. Okay. I don't mean that, but I'm saying if, if I apply myself and I figure out what the steps are and what the blockers are and I do the steps and I overcome the blockers, it's up to me. No one, the Calvary's not coming. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful childhood in that regard. Very entrepreneurial household that goes with that, obviously. Uh, but if you will get up and leave the cave, kill something, and drag it home, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Love that answer. Uh, the second question I asked him was, what, does he, what is the thing that he admires and respects the most about his wife? And, mm. I'm, and I'm curious uh, for you as well, the thing you admire and respect the most about why you decided to be with your wife. She has uncanny, scary wisdom. Mm. Her insight she can read a room. I just go in a room and have a party and then wonder about the people later. She can walk into a room and reads everybody's mail before we leave. And she comes out and she goes, you know, that guy over there, that's a good guy. You know, mm -hmm. that gal over there, she's getting ready to be in trouble. She's getting ready to step in a bear trap. And she has this discernment, this ability to read people and, um, this level of wisdom and got to tell you, that's a really handy decision-making tool to have her, uh, uh, you know, standing beside me going, uh, 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 we're not doing that. And I'm like, eh, every time I go against that suggestion, I lose 10 grand or more. <laughs> so I'm not doing that. Yeah. Right. So you, do you lean on her for a lot of, uh, feedback or, or wisdom on big deals that you do or decisions in the yeah. business? One of the things we learned when we went broke was, was that I was not listening to her. Um, and, uh, she wasn't speaking up either. She mm. was kind of doing the, uh, uh, I'm, I'll stay home and she's Southern, you know, I'll stay home and raise the kids. And, uh, and meanwhile, she's thinking bridge out, bridge out, bridge out, you know, and not saying so. So she had to learn to find her voice in this, but there's a proverb that says who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her and he will have no lack of gain. Mm. Interesting. Wow. So I decided I didn't want a lack of gain. And so, uh, I, I, uh, and she's virtuous, so I can count on her. And, uh, if she's not virtuous, I call her on it. Uh, but when we get ready to make major decisions, a major purchase of a, uh, a, an asset at the bill, uh, at the office, uh, a major hire of a leader. Uh, when we first started hiring people, that's where we learned to interview spouses was Sharon and I would go to dinner with you and your spouse with our first 30 or 40 team members that came on board years ago. And um, I'm just looking for her discernment, you know, cause she's got those antennae on her head. She can go weirdo, weirdo, you mm -hmm. know, and she can see spot them a mile away and I can't. And so, uh, cause I just like everybody. I'm just like a Labrador <laughs> retriever, you know? So, uh, and, but she, she helped me figure out that we're not going to hire. And sometimes their spouse spoke into it. So it's a two way street. Yeah. You know, we just have dinner. It's not a formal interview. We just have dinner with you. And, and our team still does this in the hiring process. It's the final thing you mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. Spousal interview, we call it, but it's not really an interview, but it comes from that proverb. And it comes from that idea. We don't, uh, right now, our Ramsey family foundation, our charitable giving stuff is run by my daughter, Denise. She's our director of that for the last decade. And she's very competent as the director of a substantial foundation. Uh, but when we're doing something weird, that's off budget, she emails in to Sharon and I, and this afternoon, I got an email, large amount, got the ability to pay this caterer to go in and feed all the nurses and feed all the docs at this hospital. Do we want to spend that? And Sharon and I make that decision together. Mm. 
And so quick email, took 30 seconds. Yeah, we, we got the budget, got the room in the budget. Yeah, we got a miscellaneous category. Tap it, do it, game on, <clears throat> okay? Wasn't really a tough decision because all the mechanisms were put in place ahead of time. But major hires, major purchases, major donations, that kind of stuff, uh, she speaks into. Uh, and now we buy copier paper without talking to her. Okay. That's not what I'm mm -hmm. talking about, but, but, and, and, you know, most of the hires down here, she was not involved in 98% of who works here today or 90% of who works here today. But, uh, but still there's a tremendous benefit to having that wisdom in my life. Amazing. That's beautiful. One of the reasons I'm, it's one of the reasons I'm vastly successful. Before we continue this video, make sure to subscribe below and turn on the notification bell right now so you don't miss out on these great videos every single day. You got to leave only three lessons behind for the rest of us to learn from. What would you say would be your three lessons or what I like to call three truths? Well, I think the most important lessons, probably, I think I said this way, my, my rich, I said all the time, my rich had always said, you know, knowledge is finite. Stupidity is infinite. <laughs> so stay stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great truth. Because that's how you get knowledge. Mm. And, but he, he used to always say that to me because my dad, always hid behind his diploma, PhD. He didn't know anything. Most school teachers don't know much. You know, when, when people ask me about the Fed, what is the Fed? I said, have you ever watched uh, The Wizard of Oz? And mm -hmm. they go, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know how Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Lion and the Straw Man, they went down the yellow brick road. They were hoping to find the wizard. And the wizard was going to give the lion a heart or, uh, you know, Dorothy, whatever she wanted, and all this stuff. And when they get to the wizard or the Fed, there was a midget behind of it. There was nothing behind of it. That's the Fed. That's the PhD. They're hiding behind this thing called diploma. Mm. That's obsolete. And so that's the second lesson. You know, be careful who your teachers are. Make sure your teacher actually practices what they teach. So my tax guy is Tom Wheelwright. His book is Tax Free Wealth. You really want to stop paying taxes? Get that book. It's 20 mm -hmm. bucks. You'll probably save a couple of million dollars over your lifetime. But if you don't change, you know, the, this left ear and right ear, that gap between there, you're screwed. Yeah. And then you have my other friend, mother <clears throat> advisor, Andy Tanner. He wrote the book, St uh, uh, Stock Market Cash Flow. Instead of investing for the long term, he makes money in markets going up or down. I'd rather do that than buy, pray, and hold and listen to Susie Orman and Dave Ramsey. But it's your choice. Yeah. Other guys, uh, um, Kenny McElroy, he writes all my real estate books. He's my real estate partner. We've made fortunes together. You know, this it's just fortunes, tax free. Why would you go to school? Just buy some books, study them. Get their YouTube. You make, some, make some mistakes on your own, right? <laughs> oh, you don't have to just get stupid. But, yeah. you know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit. Meek means egoless. I'm going to learn. So I know what goes on in the stock market. That's why I stay out of it. But if you don't know, it might be the best place for you. So if you want to stay in the stock market, that's Andy Tanner, stock market cash flow and 401 chaos. Mm. They tell you what's really going on because they're real. They're in the market every day. You know, Jim Rogers wrote Investment Biker and all that. He lives in Singapore. He basically says the problem with the Fed is they don't know what they're talking about. They're idiots. And we listen to them. They're the Wizard of Oz. Mm. Everybody thinks they know something because they got this piece of paper. Like my poor dad called a PhD. Rich dad, poor dad had a financial statement. You cannot lie in your financial statement because that's fraud. PhDs, diploma. Rich people, financial statements. Mm. The other thing is this. I don't have a financial planner. I have a family office. The rich have family offices. So we have money to lend constantly. We make so much money. Mm. So there's a difference in the mindset, the intelligence of what you learn. 
So I think the most important thing that you're teaching people, you know, in the school of greatness, mm-hmm. is basically choose your teachers. What yeah. path you want to go down? You know, when your football career ended, it was the best thing that happened to you. Yeah, started finding mentors. Yeah, and that's what you're doing. And so you, you're you're a great role model for your generation. Oh, thank you. In my generation, there's still baby boomers. What's that? Hello, boomer. What, what do they say? Hey, boomer. <laughs> We're idiots. <laughs> Jeez, they still think, most boomers are still counting on social security and the stock market. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, did you, I don't know if you said the third one. You said knowledge is uh, finite. Stupidity is infinite. So stay stupid, number one, which I love that because I've always felt like I'm the make dumbest mistakes. person. In the- make mistakes is what it means. Be What's humble. that? Be humble and make mistakes. I learned Yeah, that. exactly, exactly. Uh, be careful who your teachers are. And the third one was... Um, don't hide behind a diploma. Mm. You know, if somebody says to you, da, 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 so can, can show me your financials. So like, I, that, that's the story of a family office versus, mm-hmm. everybody has a home office. That's different than a family office. So yeah. a family office is like a, a hedge fund. Mm. But what rich guys have their own hedge funds or their own private equity firms is what it is. Yeah. So that's where you want to get to. So when you're there, the difference is mm-hmm. when people ask me for money, like, like on Shark Tank, the first thing I ask them for is not the diploma. Show me your financials. Mm. If they don't have financials, I, I won't invest with them. Because they, they, they don't know what they're talking about. Just because you have a cool degree or fancy paper oh. doesn't mean you can get results. Oh, God. You see, you can lie from behind a diploma. That's what the Fed's doing. So that's all Rich Dad Poor Dad is about. It's about financial statements. And the cash flow game is you physically, again, like I said, it's physically, yeah, there's four intelligence, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. Mm -hmm. The game makes you fill out your financials on these four intelligences. Yeah. Because you have to move the things, you have to fill out the numbers and all this stuff. So it's it's max learning. Unfortunately, the game is sold out. But anyway, that's how I designed 26 years ago. 20, I don't know how long. Yeah. They can, go, they can go order it, and it'll be out hopefully in the next couple of months. They can get it on a wait list. I don't know. Everybody's on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> you have, uh, you've, you've impacted millions of people's lives around the world. I remember actually playing the game with my mom. 20, 22 years ago. I don't know. I was a kid, yeah. a teenager, and I remember, you know, learning these principles. And even though I didn't fully understand it, and even yeah. though it seemed like <laughs> too much for me to understand as a teenager and overwhelming, it planted a seed. And so did the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I learned about at an early age. So I want to acknowledge you for Thank you. giving, being a teacher in a world of teachers, yeah. educate yeah. people on a specific way, not the only way, but a way that has worked for you and worked for millions of people around the world for constantly creating value, board games, being creative with your content to educate us in this way. And uh, I'm, I'm really just grateful that you continue to show up and serve and, and be yourself because you are a unique human being. And I appreciate you, Robert, for your own uh, style and approach. Well, and, thank you. But you know why you and I are great teachers? Why is that? We didn't do well in school. Yeah, because we have to be curious and learn. Well, we just like that style of education. It, it worked yeah. for my poor dad. It didn't work for my rich dad. Yeah. And you see, that's what I mean. Choose your teachers wisely. Yeah. And there's millions of ways you can become rich, but you got to find your way, your teacher, your path. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you've got this book out now, Who Stole My Pension? Uh, make sure to check this out to really educate yourself on what's happening with pensions, 401ks, and what you can do with your money moving forward. This is great. That's going to help a lot of people who are going to be trapped uh, if they're not educated on this. Well, the, well, the, the biggest reason is if you're young is your age. Uh-huh. You know, most you guys will have your parents and siblings moving in with you. And we'll have to pay for them. My mom is yeah. 68, 69. I'm already having to figure out, okay, how do I support her? And, and, if, and if she loses her 401k, IR, you're toast. Yeah. She's making a few thousand, I think, from her retirement and pension or a couple different things she has from the company she worked in for. In that book, is a, the pilots like me, you know, mm-hmm. the, my, my pilot friends were making 400K a year. They got nothing done. Wow. 
And then the other guy's a UPS driver, a Teamster. He was making 5000 a month, now I'm making 900 a month for UPS. Yeah. Those are major firms. So you read who stole my pension, and it gives you a glimpse more into the, what's coming. It's the next crisis coming up. It's a baby boomer crisis. Just like the pandemic is a baby boomer crisis. They're picking on the old guys again. Anyway. <laughs> um, make sure you guys get this book. Also, 25th anniversary of Rich Dad Poor Dad coming up next year. Yeah. Go get that book. If you have already read it in the past, read it again because we constantly need to be reminded and educated. And we see things how different. Learn. What's that? Repetition is how we learn. You know, That's it. We, we constantly got to learn. Uh, even if we've learned it in the past, yeah. you, you might have forgotten it. You got to relearn and reapply what yeah. you learn. Yeah. yeah. So get that book. Uh, we try to stock our shelves and, and give them away to people. How many times have I gone through this book? So I'm you're a, saying you didn't master it after the first time? No, I'm a slow learner. Yeah. You know, I'm a, a poor reader and a poor writer. But that's why we're good teachers. Mm -hmm. I love it. I've got uh, one final question for you, and I, I and people can follow you online. They can get the book. We'll link everything up here. Um, you've got some great stuff on social media on Instagram, so I'd say go follow Robert on Instagram as well. Um, my final question for you, Robert, is what is your definition of greatness? <laughs> Are you getting up every day. <laughs> At my age, you gotta worry about that stuff, you know. I mean, I said I, my plan was to die at seventy-two. Oh, I almost died so many times. You know, I went down three times in Vietnam, and uh, my days were numbered from the start. I've had open heart surgery. I've had cancer. I've had pneumonia. I've had malaria. And so, you know, when everybody talks about this COVID nineteen, I said, I've been there, done that one, you know. But each one of it inspired me to get healthier. Mm. And so this crisis should inspire people to get wealthier or you can be a loser. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why I'm going with that, but it's just all, everything bad is good. Mm -hmm. And everything good will be bad. Or that's what Nazim Taleb says, you're either fragile, robust, or anti-fragile. And the people following you are anti-fragile or they wouldn't be following you. Yeah, that's it. Robert, thank you so much for your wisdom, for sharing today. I can't wait to learn more. As one of my teachers, I want to continue to learn from you. So thanks for everything, man. And thanks to all you guys who are following you as a teacher. If you're looking for more greatness in your life, make sure to check out this video right here. And also check out our free PDF, The Three Secrets to Unlock the Power of Your Mind to Help You Change Your Life. Download it right here.